All right, welcoming to the show, the one, the only, Richard Patrick. How are you, my man? I'm, I'm very gl- blessed to be here. Thank you very much. Of course. It's great to have you here. I was just checking out some of the shows you did with Nine Inch Nails. Incredible. Mm-hmm. I think it's been like 30 years since you've done shows with them, right? Very, very long time. Since the turn of, since before the turn of the century, I think. It must yeah. have been incredibly emotional, I would imagine, right? It was insane. If you listen closely to Eraser, I was crying when I first came out. It was so emotional. It was so unbelievably emotional and amazing. And I cannot stress uh, enough how amazingly generous Trent was and everybody with their Atticus and all the guys and, and, you know, everyone learned Hey Man, Nice Shot, my song that I wrote that kind of split us up a little bit. And um, you know, I, I, uh, I was just absolutely in awe of, of how gracious and amazing Trent has become as a, as a person. And it's just awesome. Interesting. He's, I mean, that show was like two years in the making, right? And then with yeah. COVID and whatnot, I believe it got pushed back, but tell me how the whole thing came about. I want to obviously get into your history and Trent, unpack a lot of stuff. Yeah. Through it. Trent came out and he just, he sent everybody a mass email that was involved and he said, this is what I want to do. I want to play a concert in Cleveland where we, you know, along with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction and everything. And I want um, uh, everyone to come out for, to play these five songs, including Hey Man, Nice Shot, which was just unbelievable. Amazing. And we started the ball rolling Well, that show got canceled. It was supposed to be at the Nautica stage in Cleveland, and so it got canceled. And then he announced another show in Cleveland, and I said, hey, remember that (laughs) idea you had like a a ways back about playing the show in Cleveland? He said, let's fucking do it. Let's do Cleveland and um, at Blossom Music Center, which is another huge place because that's the place where I grew up in Cleveland that we went and saw all our favorite bands. You know, we went and saw New Order and Depeche Mode and, you know, uh, all the rock and roll, the, all the festivals that came through, including the first Lollapalooza, yeah. where I jumped out on stage, came back with nothing but my combat boots on. <laughs> and um, so it, playing Blossom was a huge, another massive emotional thing. And... Um, it was just the most amazing concert. Like it was, uh, it was. We, you know, we played. Hey man, I shot. Like we played. He said, "You're singing the second verse and had like a whole incredible." You know, and I got to sing. You know, that's a that's oh, yeah. a hugely important song for Trent. And Definitely. he just he just you're singing. The, you know, the the second verse to hey, to had like a whole. I'm like unbel. It just felt unbelievable. It I was, was yeah. It was I was so telling you amazing. before I, in the hallway that you know out of all the shows I've ever seen in my life, it was definitely the greatest rock show mm-hmm. I've ever seen at Jones Beach some years ago. Yeah. So I, I imagine it's incredibly. I mean, you get a call like that, and obviously you guys have kept up your friendship for many years. Yeah. You've stayed in touch, but still, when you get a call like that, are you thinking, hey, it's kind of come full circle for me with my friendship with him? Yes, totally. I mean, we've been talking for like 20 years, uh, you know, just as friends. And, you know, when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing went down, I was just absolutely blown away. And I told him I was super proud of him. And he's like, well, you're playing, you know, we got to play this, this show together. So it, it, yeah, the the friendship is is amazing and and uh, it's just awesome. You know, Nine Inch Nails is the shit. Yeah. Uh, no matter what, like, you know, uh, no matter who you are, Nine Inch Nails it, it has a huge like just amazing spot in in the world's culture. And uh, he 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 has kept up the name and kept up the the music and he's done an amazing job. He I can't say anything more good about the guy. He's just he has brought it for the past 30 years and and just made amazing music and it's 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 i'm super proud to be a part of the lineage that he has created yeah, incredible legacy. I want to get into that. There's so much to unpack, obviously. Take me back to the beginning. The show is a little bit about your history, obviously how you grew up, and we'll get into Filter. Mm-hmm. A lot of We were just talking a little bit about Army of Anyone and a lot mm-hmm. of your side projects, even scoring music and, and the new record, of course, we'll get into. But yeah, initially, you grew up in Needham, Massachusetts, right? I was born in Needham, and then two weeks later, I was moved to uh, <laughs> uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So I acquired a Southern accent at, at the age of... <laughs> 
you know, zero to around five when I left. And then we moved, my dad moved quite a bit. We moved up to Cincinnati, Ohio. Then we moved to Detroit, Michigan. And then we moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And that's where we stayed for a number of years. We stayed there and that's where I kind of grew up was in Cleveland. And what was the music you grew up? I know later on in life, you got into the skinny puppy and a no, lot of the things that connected puppy to you. Was in, immediately. immediately. There was, uh, there was a, focus from my brother Robert uh there was a focus on punk uh, early on he he told me this is the clash from now on you will listen to the clash and I'm like okay Terminator you're like <laughs> you're right I will you know and I got into the clash and what how old were you when you were into that I was probably 12 or, or right around there and so were your parents into music my dad was in the, he was the, the trumpet player for the Virginia Tech Orchestra. So oh, he was great. first chair. He was really great as, a, as, a, as a, you know, or, you know, classically trained trumpet player. Um, but my mom wasn't necessarily, my mom could sing. She could hold a tune, but she wasn't like, you know, really trying to be a singer. So your brother was really the one that turned John to all this great music early yeah, on. My brother was like, take the Kiss record. And move it over here, <laughs> and now we're going to listen to punk rock, and this is this is the Clash. Enjoy. And maybe a little bit. I of just Bowie did. I just did you a favor, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and oh, Bowie, and yeah. you know all the other, and a lot of Led Zeppelin, and and there was still, you know, rock, rock and roll was, you know, primarily what he gave me rock and punk rock and you know and what was life growing up for you like in cleveland at an early age um it was it was crazy it, you know we didn't have i mean like i saw something online it was i was generation x and it was just like you know my dad got me a 10 speed bike and said good luck have fun <laughs> and we would drive around all summer on our bikes and go down to the arcade and play video games all day and get into trouble and like, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like good luck, you know? Yeah. It, it's just, so it was, it was very freeing. I mean, you know, if school was one thing, you know, doing school and then like, but like after school, it was just a free for all. I could go over to Buzzy's house and, and Justin, Justin, uh, Mauer's house and, and play guitar over there. And, and I started playing guitar when I was nine. So I had, the guitar I was always carrying that around and and uh, I was always way into music back then and I think my first band back in 1979 was called Heat Haze mm. and, uh, and what was then, that music like it was terrible <laughs> you know it was just a bad. bunch of kids I have feedback yeah. solos and right. you know just a lot of noise and you know we did a, we did a couple uh, covers of uh of uh, like uh, I don't know we we would play um, uh, Amy by I, I think my fifth grade talent show I I played the song Amy by Rick Nielsen oh, amazing and then some some Who covers and uh, uh, but yeah just a lot of noise a lot of a lot of craziness and at certain point there's like a scene almost that starts to form in Cleveland you have a band called the Act right mm -hmm. and then Trend ends up having this band which I guess was sort of awful called the Exotic Birds the Exotic Birds they were not terrible it wasn't awful it was musically sound right. I mean they they understood verses and choruses and bridges and stuff like that and for Trent to be involved in it even at 18 he 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 had a sense of what was He going had a on. sense that it was like, this is okay for now. Like, he, he quickly, you know, he was like, this is okay for now. I'm going to do this for the fun of it kind of thing. It's and probably the most un rock and roll name, by the way, the Zog Birds. The Zog Birds, I mean, yeah. It's, like it, it's, it, was, it, was, it was bad. Yeah. I mean, it, but, but in all fairness, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't like embarrassingly terrible. It was, it was just kind of bad, you know, like kind of goofy. So your band ends up actually opening up for yeah, his my band. band <laughs> my band <laughs> opens up for this band and I'm, yeah. I'm 16 at the time and I, it was called the act and it was with my buddy Paul Rosinko and, and Dave Soleil. And, um, I was this kind of the default singer just because I was the only one who could sing that we knew. And, um, it was, you know, I was, by then I'd found you too, and the digital delay had crept into my life. And, uh, I was playing all that digital delay guitar stuff like the, the edge. edge. Yeah. And, um, uh, 
pursued that for a while during high school, you know, kind of hung out with, met Trent at Pi Keyboards and Audio. And, uh, and when you first meet him, is there an instant connection or is he like, I've seen your band? He's, he said, my manager was just here and he said, hey, Trent, your little brother's here. Right. And he goes, I don't have a little brother. And he goes, yeah, who's that? And 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 it was me. And I was just, you know, you do just, look a little like him. We I, we we looked uh, yeah. especially yeah. when we were younger. It was it was a family resemblance. It was <laughs> yeah. like it was like Uncanny. he literally could have been my brother. Yeah. And um, but yeah, so we, we our friendship started then. It was, and I I think he had sold me some uh, equipment at the Pi Keyboards and Audio. Oh, he worked there. He worked at Pi oh, okay. Keyboards and Audio. And, um, and then, yeah, we just kind of hit it off from there. And then ultimately you start shopping for a deal with your band yeah. and I guess it doesn't go so well and you start to get into some darker music, whether it be ministry or skinny yeah. puppy, right? Exactly. I, you know, the, 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 to take the, the filter, you know, music was not necessarily as, as heavy as I wanted it to be. And it wasn't necessarily as cool. And when we got turned down by labels, I was just like, what is happening? And Trent was like, you got to start listening to different music and, <laughs> you, you know, like get into different stuff. And so Dave Soleil came over with The Land of Rape and Honey by Ministry. And it was just absolutely everything had changed. Like there was two times in my life before Ministry and after. Like it was, it was like, wow, I had no idea heavy, mean music like this could be created with essentially drum machines yeah. and, and samplers. And, you know, cause for the most part, I figured that was Depeche Mode's, you know, world. I didn't, and, and so many other bands that were pop, like, you know, uh, Kaja Goo Goo or whoever, you know, like yeah. just so many pop bands use synthesizers and it was really, it was skinny puppy, you know, when skinny puppy, when, when I, and Trent took me to skinny puppy, he was like you gotta you have to see this and i was already like convinced that industrial music was the shit and um he we saw skinny puppy and he, he, i just remember being <laughs> scared to death you know it was amazing since you know? if you listen to some of your early work like soldier of misfortune you can hear the u2 influences mm -hmm. on it right? sure and then later on obviously it got heavy industrial um yeah. but yeah i mean so so at soldiers of misfortune was like Kind of peeling back the, the 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 thing of like yeah I am influenced by you too at some right. point it it, did, right. it it poked its head it out did, it did for sure yeah. so at some point you decide you know Trent says to you hey listen you know we should really try this and we should you know I'm, I'm working on this record let me play you this record that I'm working on right. and you checked it out when you first heard that that well, first he had, album he had called me several times and we talked on the phone and he basically was like we're going to get a record contract. Like it is not some unobtainable thing. Right. We are going to get a record contract. We, and, and it's like, and he's like, and I need to know like people are with me. And there was a little bit of back and forth, but then like, now, had you heard his music before? Some of, in the beginning, in the beginning, it was like, okay, maybe this is, maybe, you know, it was, it was very early on yeah. and he had a couple of songs that he had that there was a song called I Want to Believe. And it was, it was almost probably like lyrically, it was almost like the first thing that, that turned into Terrible Lie, mm. but it wasn't, it didn't sound like that. And, um, eventually he, he went cold and like disappeared and I saw him again and he noticed that I had looked completely different. Like I was just completely, totally different. Black hair, nose rings, and just gothed out. Just <laughs> super gothed out, yeah. industrial, like, you know, darkness. Right. And he was like, what's, got, Oregon, what's, go, what's gotten into you? And I'm like, I just listened to Ministry and Skinny Puppy and the Revolting right. Cox and blah, 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 blah. And he was like, I think I have something for you. It's called Nine Inch Nails. And, and, and he played me a variety of songs. And I had heard some of it. He played like Sanctified was one of his songs. Um, but when he played me Head Like a Hole, that was when I was like, holy shit, this is huge. Now, these were the demos for Pretty Hate Machine at that point, right? Yeah, I, heard, I had heard the demos for Pretty Hate Machine, but when he played me and then he played me Down In It, which was the Adrian Sherwood mix. Sure. Uh, that was like another like holy shit like man you sound amazing 
And he was like, really? You like it? I'm like, yes, this is insane. This is so good. And at some point he asked you to join the band, right? Yeah. He eventually was like, do you want to come on as a guitar player and like sing backups and, and you know, and I was just like, absolutely. <laughs> right. Like I'll quit my job today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Where were you working by the way? Uh, as a telemarketer for a, a, co a company. I can't even remember. I remember I, those uh, days, like the telemarketing yeah. days I used to, cause I would play in a band in the, the late eighties in LA and every guy in a band was working as a telemarketer. Yeah. I don't know what the hell we were selling, like light bulbs yeah, or just weird, like, sh you know, cutting shears or whatever the hell it was. It was a, some kind of, some kind of thing to fund your kid's college based on your real estate <laughs> right. assets. It was all like a scam. Yeah, it was a, right? yeah, probably a scam. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so you quit this incredible career of telemarketing <laughs> <laughs> and you, yeah. and you go on to, to play with him in this record, which ends up selling 3 million copies and one yeah. of the greatest records ever, I would yeah. dare say. So do you remember those early days and even the van tour days oh early on with the sales? What were I, those like? Do you romanticize about those days? Those days were the funnest days of our lives. Yeah. We were completely like, this is it. It's do or die. We have only one shot at this, and we're going for it full fucking bore. And it was like there was a, a an incident at um, the 930 Club in Washington, D.C., where he threw a beer at me, and I threw a fucking beer back at him, and the crowd went, Yeah! And so the next thing we know, like, we're fighting on stage. Like, like a real fight. Like, we start like fist fighting, fighting yeah. on, like, he would tackle me for no reason. And, and, like, it got violent. And he would throw microphone stands at me. And, and, <laughs> and it was just amazing. Now, did you know he was playing around? Or did you he think, was I'm, I'm actually possessed. really... possessed. Right. <laughs> you know, like, like, it was, it was... It was it was just like it was over the top. It was our pyro. Right. It was it was it was like it was your version of a kiss show. I it guess, was so. it was because look at the mosh pit. Right. Yeah. Like the, the 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 audience wasn't moshing yet. They were standing there, kind of like just like freak, like you know, just like whatever local show band. Us what you got, you know, yeah. Like at the nine thirty club, there's only thirty people there, and so. Like we wanted excitement, so we started like bouncing off each other and like tackling each other and like pushing each other and and and, and kind of being aggressive. And they started getting aggressive. The audience would get aggressive, and they would push each other and mosh. Yeah. And, and you know, it was it was when moshing was you know kind of still underground, and it was like yes, yes, it's it's we're a mosh band. We're not like just you know just like synth pop. We're we're moshing. Like, yeah. Let's make it a mosh pit. Even if you thing. think about the infamous show, obviously the Woodstock show with the mud slinging back yeah. there, right? He always probably had yeah. that premonition of showmanship. Yeah. And you know we're gonna, this we're not just gonna stand around and play our songs. It was, and we have to do something extra every time. Exactly. And even in Lollapalooza, like it, the, the only thing we could really do was he would, he would fully tackle me <laughs> like in the song sin, usually in the guitar solo, he would come up from behind me and tackle me and just with your guitar on, with my guitar yeah. on and like fully <laughs> tackle me like fairly dangerous, a hundred miles an hour, like fully tackle me. And like, he didn't, yeah, he doesn't know this, I don't think, <laughs> but the right side of my body took so much abuse that like I started limping and that limping gave me a huge back problem. And the next thing you know, I had to have back surgery because of all that limping and, and the, the, how weak my right leg got. Uh, and well, I had, now I had to have a huge back surgery. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. And the, the, the doctor was like, who, how long did you play football? I'm like, no, no, I was being tackled. By this guy, Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails. It was like, it's a long story. He's like, are you an MMA fighter? He's, like, like, he's like, what the hell did you do to your legs? Wow. You know, you know, during this time, I said it was, it was like a brawl on stage and he would throw shit. He would throw his microphone stand and people would get hit. Pod boy got gashed in the head. Like it was real. Blood was spilt. You yeah. know, like it was an absolutely crazy. You know, it was it it was 
no holds barred, just total reckless abandon. Just well, it seems like he he also was incredibly confident in those early days that he was going to make it, right? Because he said to you, "We're getting this record deal. It's not a question." Yeah. Did you know that record was going to go on to do what it did? I mean, I mean, we all hoped it was going to do good, but like we, we were we were so scared. And see, the the, the record contract that he signed was so oh, TBT. one-sided. Yeah. It was such a bad. It's it's literally a, a case study at at a university here in town of what not to do as far as recording artists and mm. um because they but, basically signed his he life was, away for he's he, he, he i don't want to go into the gory details but it was a very one-sided but it was the only record contract we could get at the time and like all these other labels were like you know kind of him and and hawing and it was so hard to get a label back then, especially because alternative music was not big. But also, in a sense, you were sort of creating your own genre. Yeah. Because Skinny Puppy was never a major band, right? Skinny, and Ministry was always underground, yeah. right? So. Skinny Ministry like made enough money to keep Ministry alive. Same with Skinny Puppy. Um, and they were doing, they were huge in our opinion. Like, well, like back in the day, I was like, oh my God, to be as, to be able to play clubs everywhere in the world, right. like, holy shit, like uh, it would be amazing, you know? Like, but they never changed the game the way Nine Inch Nails went on to change the game. Trent, I think, I mean, I, 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 I remember conversations where Trent says, we're going to be the crossover band that that like makes it like the man Trent wouldn't necessarily say that, but the manager, John mom was like, we want to cross over and become main, like huge. We yeah. want to like, and, and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what they did. Yeah. Talk sure. to me about the, during, uh, obviously you end up playing in the band. Uh, I think you left in 93, but in yeah. 1990, there's this infamous snuff film that, uh, you uh -huh. know, sort of hard copy did an expose on. Right. There wasn't really a snuff film. Right. But talk to me about the story behind it. Cause it's a kind of fascinating story when I started yeah. getting into a deep dive about uh, the history it's, of the band. It's very simple. What happened? Um, we were shooting the down in it video and in the back of an alley, they had taken a Super 8 camera and they wanted to create like a crane shot of the camera being pulled down. You know, basically you pull the camera down and in and run the film backwards and it looks like it's going up. But it's it, it looks like a, a crazy way to get a shot, you know, basically. And we were, you know dirt broke making this video but like it was primitive it was very primitive yeah. and they had fishing wire and we remember <laughs> saying like, that fishing wire is not gonna it was like this plastic nylon fishing wire it was like it, it is not gonna make it it's like spinal tap with the stone yeah. edge coming down on so the they have this super eight they have these weather balloons these big balloons with the super eight camera and the and the the bad fishing wire. Well, he lets it out, and the next thing you know, boom! The fishing wire breaks, and the camera's gone. And it's like, oh well, we have another one. Let's do it again. So they had another crappy old Super 8 video, uh, you know, uh, Super 8 actual film camera. We got another one. We redid the shot, and it and it worked out. And we and we used that shot. Well, this balloon travels all the way across Lake Michigan and lands in a. In in a in a farmer's field with the camera with the camera and the the farmer calls the police and the police come and they 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 get this footage and they they develop the 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 footage and then they they look at it and they're like oh my god this is like a murder and it wasn't. Trent was lying on the ground. He's supposed to look deceased. And I'm behind. I'm like coming. I had to walk backwards, you know, because the camera was going up. But like um, it's the footage looks insanely suspicious and they're trying to figure out what it was. So they get the FBI involved and they realize, holy shit, like you can see an L train. Oh, this came from Chicago. They and they get all the way down to the to the alley. They find they start asking questions about who's in this alley. Well, the props guy, we were shooting it at his studio. So the props guy goes, Oh my god, this is 
this is in the Nine Inch Nails video footage that took off that day. This is, you know, this isn't a murder. This is, well, they're like, well, we want to verify that this isn't a murder. Do you know who the guy is? And then it's Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. And so they track him down and they, they I guess they called him and said, are you alive? Are you, are you healthy? Is this, is this what happened? But like, you know, Trent thought it was hysterical because yeah. it was like making a fool out of the, the media, uh, the, out, out of, uh, well, no, and the, the police, author- and the police. The authorities, yeah, yeah. the authorities. Yeah. But um, I I can't believe, you know, like it was just one of those things. And it was, you know, it just it got on hard copy and hard copy was like CNN back in the day yeah. or Fox News back in the day. It was like, you know, amazingly huge press. And we were just, I was just like, you're the luckiest son of a bitch. <laughs> like, it is not a murder video. It's a Nine Inch Nails video. It's a Nine Inch Nails video. Yeah. <laughs> so talk me through, obviously, the again, the infamous 1991 Lollapalooza. You do the show. It's, I think, you and Ice T, and it's mm-hmm. a crazy lineup back in the day. Do you remember that show? Like, what, what are your memories of that show, aside from being tackled oh, on stage from Trent? Being tackled was the number one thing, but it was amazing because my favorite record of, of that era f- was Jane's Addiction. Yeah. And... To play a concert at 5 a.m. or no 5 p.m., you know we're we're kind of like right before they started lights, like so we would go on stage, do our show, be crazy. You know it was a solid 45 minute set, and we were just super intense the entire time. Our merch was going crazy, like they were like it was it was a very successful uh, time. But then on top of that, I'm 22 years old, you know, or 21 years old, and like I get to be at this concert every night, right. so. For Jane's Addiction, I would go down to the, to the, to the front of the stage where there's that moat, you know, and I would tip the security guards like twenty bucks each, and I would say, I'm just gonna sit right here, make sure no one comes over and like kicks my ass, and like you know, <laughs> and so they were like, cool, bro, f- from Nine Inch Nails, great, and so I'm sitting there with a six pack of beer and a, pa- and, a and a pack of cigarettes, and I'd watch. Jane's Addiction every night for like, you know, 21 shows. Yeah. And it was, that alone was just amazing because Jane's Addiction is still one of my all time favorite bands. Yeah, and yeah. Shout out to Friend of the Show, Perry. But we, Susie we love Sue her. and Dave Navarro yeah. and just, and all these amazing characters and just like, you know, like I was, it was rubbing elbows with some really cool P and Perry Farrell, yeah. you know, like he's just, what's up, bro? Good to see you, man. <laughs> you know, like it was, it it was, it was, I know what you want. We'd smoke a little pot together, and, you know. You do a great peripheral, by the way. Thanks, man. <laughs> At some point, you end up deciding to leave the band. And it must mm-hmm. be hard to leave a band like that, mm-hmm. especially with the career trajectory that was going on. But yeah. I think there was sort of a disparity where, you know, Trent was living, let's face it, he was like living in a mansion. Yeah. And then you're going back after the tour and probably like living with your parents. Yeah. And yeah, it it's kind of hard to, there's yeah. always the band where the, you know, the guy maybe who writes the songs mm-hmm. yeah. is making all the money. And the other guys are in it, and that's hard. Well, it was amazing because af- after Lollapalooza, we went to Europe and we played for Guns N' Roses, and which was totally a nightmare because the Guns N' Roses fans of Europe did not get Nine Inch Nails. Right. And that they was the, the height of Guns N' yeah, Roses. And we, and we were feeling kind of shitty. And But Trent, you know, I told Trent, I was like, you get to go home and you know live in new orleans and you get to rent an apartment down there or like rent a house and like i'm going to go back and live with my mom and dad's house and in, in my mom and dad's house and trent looked at me and he said go write a record fucker cuz you were making like what in that during that time period like 400 uh, yeah. a week or something something and, yeah. something like 700 bucks a week yeah. or something like that like you know in 1995 money or whatever. And he literally was like, go, go write a record. Like, don't bitch, go do something. And so I was like, fuck you. I, and, he, and he looked at me and he was like, he's like, you didn't know whether or not to like be upset or like, like, Actually do it. but yeah. And so I, 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 I was like, fine, I am gonna go home and I'm going to write a record and I'm going to do the best I can. And you, you're right. I'm not going to be a pussy. I'm going to, I'm going to fucking show up and, and do the work. 
But he actually, he also said there's also a pizzeria down the street if you want that to get a job. That was later. Okay. That was a little later. So now I'm doing demos, and I've and I've kind of built up like some record company love. Like like there was a record company, Warner Brothers, that wanted to sign us for like a million dollars, and it was like a, a big deal. And Trent really didn't know that, and. Um, now, were you still in the band at this point? I was, or still, already, okay. I was still in Nine Inch Nails, but I was still kind of waiting for him to write the record, you know, like to do everything, because that's the way he preferred to do things. And so he invited me out to L.A. to get ready for the tour and also to, to hopefully contribute to the downward spiral. And I was really like into it, but I, I, I had started to really freak out. Like personally, I was just like, I felt like I, I had reached my limit in the band and I wasn't really sure like uh, what I was, what I wanted to do at that point in my life. And, um, I also was broke and I lived, so I didn't live with the band at the, at the Sharon Tate house. I lived with my brother, Robert, and I decided like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to see what, see what it feels like to live with my brother, Robert, and then maybe check in. Well, when I got into LA, all of a sudden my demo tape, you know, had gotten me a manager, a lawyer, and I would gotten a record deal with, with Warner brothers. And I had you already written, Hey man, I shot yeah, at that point. Yeah, I had already written Hey okay. man. And I had like 10 other songs that I had. And the, Warner brothers was like, we're going to sign you. We're going to sign you. So I'd secured this record deal. Like, and then the manager of Nine Inch Nails, John mom and bless his heart. And he admits to saying this to me <laughs> that he said this, John called me and was like, hey, you haven't been to the house and we know you need some money. Is there any way you'd want to try? There's a driver's job at the pizzeria. If you want to go make some extra money there, there's this little pizzeria that needs a driver to go deliver pizzas. And I was like, after everything we had been through, after everything that we have had accomplished in Nine Inch Nails, that the manager of Nine Inch Nails was going to call me up and literally offer me a job, like literally hot tips on how to become a pizza delivery driver. I literally was just like, fuck you, dude. Like, f how dare you fucking say that to me? Like after everything we've been through together. And that was when I was like, I quit. And by the way, not encouraging, right? You're in this band that's about to break, and he's like, the, hey, you know. This band was breaking. Yeah. Like, we were, it was it was going to be even more huge, like, because of the downward spiral. But it was already, I mean, you said it yourself, We the Pretty Hate Machine sold 3 million copies. So it was already breaking. Yeah. Like, it was already a huge thing. But I, 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 I didn't know how to... You know, I didn't, I, it wasn't the best way to leave. Mm. Like it wasn't necessarily the way I wanted to leave. And I, in, in hindsight, I would honestly say that I would like to have done both. You know what I mean? Stay in Nine Inch Nails and do filter. But at the time, there really wasn't any way you could do a side project in, in Nine Inch Nails. And um, so you I, end up, do you actually, you play Hey Man, Nice Shot for Trent at some point, right? Yeah. And what did he say to you he, about the song? He loved it. He, loved he, it. He, he was like, this is great. This is really great, you know. And and he actually, we demoed it at his house. And he gave me that. He gave me uh, his studio for a few days, and we demoed. So the, the original tracks for Hey Man, I Shot were done at, at, at the Sharon Tate Mansion, the guitar and uh, the vocals. And then the manager calls you and says, "Hey, you know, we like this song, but maybe you won't have publishing." Or is that what are the, there was the a little? Get? Yeah, he was like, "You can't, uh, you can't have the publishing for that song." <laughs> and the publishing for that song is is going to get my kids through college, right? Like, and, and like, you're like, at that point, I just have I was to like, out there. that was like again, how dare you? Yeah, like, like, you know, and there were other people involved with the song, and like, you know, like it was already kind of like chewed up, and so I was like, I don't want. I, I they didn't I don't think they wanted to use it for the downward spiral or anything like that but like they were trying to figure out how they could include me a little bit more but like it was so convoluted and the other thing that really bothers me about it like our behavior collectively 
we were so drunk all the time. Right. Like we were, we were so drunk like the whole time, like back in those days and our addictions were just insane. So well, let's talk about that for a moment. Cause yeah. obviously you've been sober now yeah, for how 20 long? years, 20 years. So, yeah. and there's some crazy stories oh, about yeah. you on the plane. Take mm-hmm. my picture essentially yeah. was about a story that I believe you were like running around naked on a plane. No, I wasn't running around <laughs> naked, but let's just say, uh, Clothes were shed. Clothes were shed. On clothes a plane. were shed. Yeah. Right. And on, imagine on, if you did that now, you'd get like arrested. No, you'd be and... you'd be videoed <laughs> to death. Yeah. You'd be canceled, and then you'd be arrested. Exactly. Like you, you, yeah, it was bad. But like, yeah, I I was a, a free spirit when I was an alcoholic, <laughs> and <laughs> I took my shirt off on the plane, and I just was like, you know, I just was being unruly, and somehow they were like, you're you're the singer and filter. We're not going to like call the cops, but you're like, you got to put your shirt back on. You know, it was just, it was just like my fame had gotten me out of so much shit. Like you wouldn't believe how many times my fame like kicked into gear. And like, they were like, dude, I'm not going to arrest the singer for filter, but you need to put your shirt back on, but you need to put your shirt back on. Well, that was the first time I, I, I had an ordeal on a plane. The second time I was removed by SWAT. Because for smoking. I, for smoking. Yeah. And, and uh, again, one of the, one of the police recognized me and was like, let's just send him to the, sh- the, the psych ward at this, this hospital in, in outside of Midway airport. And I went there and the nurse, and this is a true story. The nurse was like, I'll get you out of this if we can go on a date. And I was like, absolutely. (laughs) And then like a week later, we were trying to go on the date. And she was like, I think you're a little too crazy for me. And I was like, you think? (laughs) You know, yeah. So what was the aha moment where you decided, you know, I really need to stop drinking? Because you you, you fell off stage, too. There was times when like it just got overbearing, right? It was just absolutely awful to be as drunk as I needed to be and functioning at the way I was functioning. It was, it was, it was, I got to a point where I was like, your dream of being a musician and singing in a band is nothing compared to your want to be wasted Mm. and your, your desire to be high on drugs and drunk. And I couldn't believe that I had actually gotten there and I was literally on a ledge like looking down uh, in this hotel room and I was looking down and I could see there was a patch of grass and there was also this like concrete and I was like, well, if I jumped just far enough, I could, if, if I jumped just right, I could land on the concrete and end it. But if I miss, I'm going to hit that grass, that grassy knoll and I might like paralyze myself. And so like, that was the, that was the level of thinking Mm -hmm. that I was at, that I had. And then I was like, this is just absolutely pathetic. Like, how can you have gotten this, this where, where drinking has just ruined your life this much that you're committing, that you're thinking about committing suicide. And so I, I just canceled the tour. I called everybody and said, I cannot live the life I've been living and I need to go to rehab as soon as possible. Mm. And was there like an intervention that took place? No, there there was no, there was, there were so many interventions that I like caught wind of and like got, got out of and, and, you know, and, uh, the, the, what they were all, you know, it's amazing. Cause when you say, okay, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about quitting drinking. Like it wasn't like, Oh really? Do you, do you think you need to quit drinking? Like, Oh, maybe we'll quit drinking. You know, it was, Oh my God, thank you. Fucking quit drinking. Yes. Yes. You have to go to rehab, whatever you can do. Like, like the, the crew, the band, like, you know, my, my road manager at the time, everybody was just like, thank God, put him in rehab. Like, I don't care that we just lost two years of touring and, and it did. And it was so bad for, because we needed to really work the amalgamate, the record, the amalgamate, and we couldn't do it. Mm. And it fell to the wayside, you know, and it didn't get the promotion that it should have because I couldn't work. And the record company was run by Tom Wally and Tom Wally's like, look, if you're not working, we're not working. Right. So see you later. Yeah. When you finally get in rehab, you yeah. Know. Well, I was saying when you finally do get sober and you start performing, it's got to be a whole nother world for you at that point. 
Uh, my first gig singing was I was singing Whole Lot of Love for Camp Freddy at the Pond. Mm. And Our it buddy was Matt Sorum and all yeah, the Matt Sorum yep. and Dave Navarro. Yep. Yep. And so my first singing out of the box was singing Whole Lot of Love, you know, like way up there, yeah. you know, you need Colette, you know, like way up there singing as hard as I could. And it was just like, and my manager said something to me at the time, which really hurt. He's like, if you did that back when you were on tour with the Amalgamite, like you would be living in a mansion. Mm. And I was just like, damn, that hurt. That's a wake up call. But yeah. it, it's also, and it's a testament to 20 years sober. Yeah. Congratulations. So, yeah. but uh, take me back a little bit. I want to talk about one of your career defining songs that we were speaking about. Hey man, I shot the mm-hmm. shot. The, the, the song is actually about our, uh, Bud Dwyer. Inspired by his public suicide. Yeah, yeah which is the craziest story. Yeah. This is a politician who, yeah. on the air, committed suicide mm-hmm. and one of the goriest, most graphic it's things you could awful. ever see on television. Yeah, it's awful. It was awful. And I honestly, I didn't, I didn't want it to be a public thing that people knew about. But someone from my record company at the time leaked it, and then I was like, on I was doing an interview for Billboard, and like the guy's like, well, it's about our Bud Dwyer, and I was like, it was inspired by our Bud Dwyer, and you know, I was twenty years old. I never thought like anyone would hear this song. I mean, I was I was making it for like, it's like, well, I hope it's cool. My friends, I'm, I hope my friends, I want my mean friends to like it, and and. You know, and stuff. So I wrote this song about Art Bud Dwyer. It's, 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 it's kind of an anti-suicide kind of... It's like a cautionary tale. Yeah, man. cautionary yeah. tale. Like, can you believe this actually happened yeah. kind of thing? Like, And um, it became this massive hit. And his relatives were going to sue me. And it was just like, why? You know, like, I, don't, I never mention his name. And he this guy held a press conference and i saw it yeah. and wrote a song about it like you know what i mean like i i can't be you know you can't take away my first amendment rights you know kind of thing cuz back then you had all these uh cassettes it was like faces of death and but that, had, you actually had watched this live on tv at the time i watched it live on tv when it happened and then i saw it cuz my social studies class was had was watching it and um, and then, like, I saw the news footage, and they show the news footage in Cleveland. They showed it in two places. It was in Cleveland, and then it was in Philadelphia. But the real hard image that I got was the—, the, the it's, there's a camera on the right angle, the, uh, from his right angle, and it shows him falling behind the podium. And that, that footage was found at the Amok bookstore on Lollapalooza. Mm. And they gave me a copy of that when I was uh, on Lollapalooza, the Amok bookstore. Because back then, you couldn't see stuff like that. It was yeah. There was no online. It was it was like, do you have a, uh, a copy of it? Like, can you believe this, this footage exists of this guy killing himself? And, yeah. You know, it was just really, really, really graphic and... Yeah, it's tough. It's tough for yeah. sure. You go on to do this record, Short Bus, that sells a million copies. Mm-hmm. And actually, that song gets played at like two in the morning mm-hmm. on a radio station. Who would have thought that they would have led to this? Colorado Springs. Exactly. So, talk so, to me about the story, how that happened, and so the song became your, you know. They were like, we need to, we need to keep you alive. We need to, to pay some bills. Let's put it on this, this, uh, soundtrack called uh demon night soundtrack and um we'll put it'll be like the 11th song in the demon night soundtrack i'm like i don't really necessarily (laughs) know what demon night is and maybe maybe you know whatever right like if you really think it's it's going to be appropriate like then fine so they put it on this soundtrack well a dj is called by the the record company like S- play something from that soundtrack tonight just play anything from that soundtrack well the dj literally had put it on in the background and was listening it got to song number 11 and he was like wow this is really cool so he puts it on at 2 a.m in the morning in colorado springs and the phones went crazy like, who is this? Who is this band? Who is Filter? Who is, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so we were literally mixing our record. And the next thing you know, 
take a pic or excuse me, Hey Man, Nice Shot was starting to chart. So we're like, what? Like, and we were still mixing. I'm like, that's not even the right mix, <laughs> you know? And like, so, uh, the song went viral or whatever. And by the time we had gotten done with the record, it was number one in, in Cleveland, Ohio. It was like the top five at five. And they, it was, it was in that. And my friends were like, you, you haven't been here, dude. This whole city's freaking out because of Hey Man, Nice Shot. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, really? Like it was, it was, and then I heard it for the first time on the radio and it was so the vindication of hearing that song and just being like, see, <laughs> you know what I mean? Incredible. It was yeah. a perfect storm, obviously. Yeah. So you go on to work with some incredible musicians over the years. Josh Freeze, one of the mm -hmm. greatest drummers, John mm -hmm. Five. I think now this is your eighth album that we're on, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about this new record, I think you kind of bring it all home where you actually played a lot of the instruments yourself in this record. Mm -hmm. You produced it. Yeah. So talk to me about the new record, which is coming up because you just released a single, but this new record is actually kind of bringing it home for you in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, about five years ago, I decided I'm going to get back into like running everything, including the computer. Like for so long, I had engineers that were like the computer guys and I would sit back on the couch and play guitar and play bass and, you know, do that kind of thing. And I would really rely on these guys and I, they were great dudes to, to work with. But at some point I got like a, 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 a be in my bonnet about like having to run everything. Like I wanted to run the software as well as, as it, it, you know, uh, create the music. And so I just got really, really dedicated towards w writing by myself. And I wrote probably f six or seven songs to completely by myself on the record. Um, but then I still wanted to work with some new friends like this kid, Zach Monowitz. I found him on Instagram and I, he was playing some crazy guitar part, the guitar part for, uh, for the beaten, our current single that we have out. And it was just like, I'm like, I have to sing over this. I don't know what you're doing. I, I like, you're crazy. Like I want to, I want to sing over this. And he was like, all right, cool. So he wrote three other parts or two other parts, sent them to me. And they were just like, you know, potentially a verse, potentially a chorus, maybe a, maybe a bridge. And then I arranged it and put it together in my computer computer and then started singing over it. Voila, within a couple of days I was done and it was a perfect song. It was like a great song. So Zach Monowitz was, was another instrumental musician on, the, on this, on this record, as well as my friend, Sam Tenez, who wrote two songs with me. Um, who's this big singer, uh, pop singer that I am friends with. And he wrote, uh, obliteration, uh, as as well as my friends Ian Scott and um, Mark Mark Markson, I think his last name is. I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but um, that was uh, another song, and that's going to be another single that we're going to release. But so much of the record was just me with my computer, and um, Elias Mullen plays drums on it. Awesome. And it's being mixed by Brian Virtue right now. So, and we're thinking about a fall release for this record, right? Thinking about early spring. Awesome. Yeah, it's interesting and fascinating. When again, when I was doing some research, you really didn't listen to Nine Inch Nails for like the thirty years yeah. that you weren't in the band because you're yeah. just like, I don't want this to affect yeah. my music at all, right? Well, I I made a a, a, a decision that I was not going to use any synthesizers or any of that, um, other than like sampling a guitar, sampling and making strange noises out of a guitar with a sampler. That was like, that was our, our key to, to limiting ourselves because we knew the comparisons were going to come. I mean, you know, it's, it's not necessarily nine inch nails. What I was listening to when I was in Nine Inch Nails, we were listening to Ministry and Skinny Puppy, you know, and, and when I was in Nine Inch Nails, I was performing it and I, I, you know, was, so I knew what it took to be in Nine Inch Nails. So when I did filter, I had to be original. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that I was completely on my own because the last thing I wanted to do was to ride Trent's coattails and be dependent on, on him for anything, which is just my mindset at the time, you know? 
Of course. And, Although if you uh, listen to like take a picture, it doesn't have any yeah. Nine Inch Nails sense. It's complete. It's almost there's a, it's almost yeah. a, a pop song at that. Yeah. Point. No. Take a picture was the heaviest song I've ever written yeah. because lyrically it was about the darkest places I've ever been as an alcoholic. The the music is the feeling that drugs and alcohol give you. This lush, gorgeous. Soundscape, soundscape, yeah. and the lyrics are all about being lost in addiction. And could you take my picture? Because I won't remember. Is literally like I literally was saying that to people because I I couldn't remember yeah. my life at all when I was drinking, you know. And um, so when I when I was asked to come and play the reunion with Nine Inch Nails, I was like, you know what? I think I should see Nine Inch Nails right. because I haven't seen Nine Inch Nails ever in my life. Like I've aside never, from playing in the band. Exa- aside yeah. from being on stage yeah. left or whatever. Yeah. And so um, we went to Santa Barbara and I asked Tri, I said, do you mind if I go to see Santa Barbara? And he was like, yeah. I was like, this is my first time seeing Nine Inch Nails and he's like he's like oh my god that's so crazy but I literally wanted to make sure that I was never sounding like him at at, at all and still we still got comparisons you yeah. know like people were like dude you sound like Nine Inch Nails I'm like no we don't I know for a fact we do not sound like Nine Inch Nails like I haven't so, heard them in 30 years you know, I haven't listened to it like and you know there was an, there was another thing like I was my nickname for three years was Piggy that song was essentially written about you, possibly? Brian Lee Skang said a week after I quit, dude's writing songs about you, Rich. He is so furious that I that I quit. He was really, really pissed that I quit. And he wrote and he wrote Piggy and and uh, Have you I, spoken to him about uh, the I, words of that I, song ever? I I I haven't really brought up the subject. Right. <laughs> but it's like, a hard subject to it's, broach, It's I just kind of right? like, because he was like, I was like, is Piggy me? And he was like, yeah. you know, he didn't really want to answer it right. when I was talking to him. But like, you know, like I was, I always thought the song that you could have it all my empire of dirt, which was, that was the real lesson. Because once I in- inherited Filter, the the problems of being in a band with hired guns, all of those problems showed up and yeah. like, you know, reared their ugly heads. You know, like I had guitar players that were pissed because I had, you know, written all these songs before and they were learning everything and having to listen to me say like, dude, you're not playing it right. You know what I mean? Like there, you know, so I had, I had, in, I had inherited this, this mountain of dirt, you yeah. know, like, and that's, that's what I brought up with Trent. I was like, that's the song that I feel like maybe I, I, I related to the most, but I kind of, avoided the piggy thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. We were talking about uh, a little bit before you came on Army of Anyone and just was it sobering? You know, I don't know if you were friendly with Scott Wheeland and if you guys, yeah. but was it sobering because you were going through your own challenges with mm-hmm. sobriety at that point to mm-hmm. see what happened to him and obviously how he passed away? Oh, yeah. No, I, I, to give you an example of my sobriety, my first day in rehab, I met Chris Cornell. Wow. And Chris, had you known Chris before? I, we met in a partying scenario, but like this was the real Chris Cornell, like sober, mm-hmm. and we were both in trouble, and like he was he was getting ready to do Audio Slave, and I was getting ready to, you know, I had just canceled a two year tour, and he, 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 you know, I was I was bummed out that it was a twelve step program because I'm an atheist. So I was like, "Well, fuck, this isn't gonna work. I'm gonna leave." <laughs> and Chris grabbed me and he said, "Dude, this is it. This is the only known remedy that like works. So if you want to stay here and be sober with me, that'd be awesome. Like you can't leave." And he kept me in rehab, mm-hmm. and I to this day remember that like he's like, "You got to stay here." You can't leave. Don't leave me here alone. You know, like you, you gotta, you gotta be sober with me, and like, cause he had ten days and I had, you know, two. Yeah. And um, so I stayed in rehab because of Chris Cornell. Wow. And when he passed away, that was just another reminder of how amazingly horrible this disease really is. And Scott, we yeah. And Scott yeah. as as well. And Scott was another one of those guys I partied with. You know, like. 
we had a great time. We're like, like, but it all of a sudden you stop having a great time and it just becomes this horrible like dependency and like it's not fun anymore because drugs worked and then all of a sudden they don't like yeah. and it's too late you're addicted and you know i have friends today that are still like to this day drunk alcoholic wow. people and they're you know i have i have you know Bandmates that I have, you know, that I I can't talk to because they're they're drinking all the time. Well, twenty years sober, so congrats on that, Thank by the you. way. And we were talking about Army of Anyone. Any chance we'll see uh, any more music one day? I, possibly. I really doubt it. Yeah. I I sadly I think um, I, I think we gave it our best shot when we were doing it. Um, Ray Luzier is an, a huge active member of Corn. Yeah. Um, the Delio brothers have Jeff Gut. They're a singer, and they love touring. And um, Robert DeLeo just put out a great new solo record. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I had an idea that maybe we could write, collaborate on this song that I wrote called Summer Child, which was uh, a perfect Army of Anyone song. Like, it it's just sounds totally like Army of Anyone. And um, I I played it to them. They both really liked it. But for some reason, we just couldn't get it together and do it. Yeah. You know? And so I I was hoping to maybe re-release it on vinyl or something like that with an added bonus song or something like that. But, like, there's just no... The the Delio brothers and and I think Ray's Ray actually played on Summer Child because I was like, look, I'll get Ray to play on it. Ray played on it. I was like, now you guys come in and do your parts, but they didn't want to like work on it the way I work on music, which is in a computer and mm. kind of you know like they like to get in a room and I, fly. I I I haven't met Zach Monowitz, uh. but yet we've written three songs together. <laughs> right. I've never been in a room with him. Period. Amazing. But we've we've worked on all this great music. Yeah. But they're like traditionalists where they really want to play everything together in a room and go over it and rehearse it and try different versions of it and. Um, I mean, I guess to be fair, if you if you listen to STP, there's such yeah. a heavy Zeppelin influence, yeah. and they just all got in a room and they played. So I yeah. guess probably them getting their head around that method is probably well. We, a little... Well, Army of Any, we demoed everything the way that I do uh, uh, the filter records. So we demoed, and they 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 we programmed all the drums before we had Ray Luzier. We programmed all the drums, but like we wrote all these songs and demoed them in my backyard, in my in my house studio. And so, like, they, they knew that that's where I was going with them. I'm like, look, I got Ray to play on it. Yeah. It sounds great. Yeah. The song is, is but I, I, they, for some reason, they didn't, they didn't take the final thing of, like, coming into the studio and working on it. And I just was like, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, either I, way, I can, I can do a lot of other things, you know. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, either way, For the Beaten just came out October 14th, and the mm-hmm. new record is coming out in the spring. And uh, I think it's the first time, like we spoke about, since 1995 that you did a lot of music on your own. Mm-hmm. But you're also playing Sick New World. We spoke about that. Corn, System mm-hmm. of a Down, 2023, mm-hmm. with Skinny yeah. Puppy. So that should Ministry, be great. Skinny Puppy. Yeah. It is just unbelievable. Death grips. Uh, uh, it's just unbelievable. Flyleaf with Lacey. Um, it is just unbelievable. The, Great lineup. The, 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 the festival. We hope. I hope it goes into like day two or something. It like. probably will. Like I was, we were talking about when we were when we were young at the festival they just had. Mm-hmm. And you're also you're doing Heaven or Hell. I think believe coming up. Heaven and Hell Heaven in and hell. in Mexico City, and that's coming up in December. Amazing. Yeah. So hopefully I'll get out to see one of these shows. Check out the new record. Does it have a title? The new record yet? I I have a working title called They Got Us Right Where They Want Us At Each Other's Throats, but I think it's too long, and I think I'm going to change it. So, no, I don't have a title yet. I was going to call it America, but then I kind of got over being political. Yeah. I I used to post everything all the time and like be a, uh, just a staunch you know activist, but then I kind of backed off on that, and and I I just feel like I want to keep it more universal and, and less topical. As we sit here today and, on election day, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. On, a, on a fantastic <laughs> election for the Democrats that like we're supposed to be 
It just wiped out of you know the house and the yeah, senate yeah. It, it's not it seems like it may not be going that way though so we'll see but it's uh, it's, it's looking good yeah. for the, it just it's just i have a problem with all the maga yeah, the yeah, maga of bullshit. course like it's it's too much yeah. we need i just want normal to, like even DeSantis is is somewhat normal compared to donald trump yeah. donald trump is uh, like disaster yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm, you know, for all of my Republican fans, I apologize. I'm just not down with the dude. I'm not down with the Don, bro. Like, get another guy. Get get someone less crazy. Yeah, I agree. But either way, the record should be out sometime in the spring. We're thinking mm-hmm. maybe March, April. Yeah, and we're going to tour our balls off. Awesome. Uh, we're going to tour crazy, and I'm really looking forward to next year. I'm Getting ready. I'm riding my bike. I'm doing all the things I need to do to stay fit. I love it. uh, Any more sound check work coming up, by the way? Uh, I'm working on a movie uh, directed by Brian Skiba. It's called Dead Man's Hand, and that will be probably out sometime in the new year as well. And uh, still working my balls off on movie scores. I love movie scores. Love it. You're a busy guy. Busy. I busy. like to keep busy. That's that's yeah. Otherwise, I'll leave resting till when I'm dead. You know? <laughs> Rich, it's a pleasure. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate definitely. it. Definitely, and hopefully, I'll see one of these shows coming up. You got it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so again. much. 